want to welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, we'll be talking about refrigerant leak detection from A to Z. And we have with us tonight, Dan Kelly, who's product manager for HVACR at Backrack Incorporated. Hey, welcome, Dan. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for arranging this. So we're just going to go through a couple of slides here. Um, <clears throat> hopefully we can get this to work okay. So um, was, this is sponsored by True Tech Tools. This is uh, True Tech. We're here to serve. Uh, we get good reviews because we care. We care about customers. We care to bring information and good products. Um, that's our team. That picture was taken back in June 2019. And actually, when we take it again near the end of this month, there'll be three new faces. Um, so we've, we've actually upgraded our staff because we've had a really uh, big spike in business these last couple of months. So I want to thank you as customers for um, for fueling our fire and we'll keep on continuing to serve. Um, this is just a picture of our warehouse. Um, I think Dan's been there. I know Jim's been there. Um, we have, uh, it's actually now 90 brands and thousands of products there. Uh, Backrack is one of our primary lines, of course. Uh, these are some of our product categories. If you're not familiar with True Tech, if you came across you know, this uh, webinar through different means, uh, you're not familiar with us, but we carry a lot of different tools, testers, analyzers, uh, leak detectors, fixed refrigerant monitors, combustible gas combustion analyzers. And those are some of the great products we carry from Backrack, who is our presenter tonight. Okay, first poll I want to run is the field no, <laughs> field of work. Let's um, launch that poll. And if you could uh, answer, we'll just wait to see. If you could just click on the screen there, get a feel for for who's in the audience. You could answer multiple times if you do, if you like do crossover work. We'll wait just a couple more seconds here and I'll share back the results with everybody. Okay, we got 72% of the people, that's really good. Okay, so we have mostly HVAC contracting here. People identify themselves as that. Uh, so I wanna thank you. So that's really pretty much squarely on target with what we wanna do. Um, Let's go to the second poll. Want to check on what your familiarity is with checking for refrigerant leaks. Again, we'll be talking about primarily refrigerant leaks here, but there are some sort of crossover things like with combustible refrigerants and you know, ultrasonic basically detects a gas leak and or an air leak. It isn't necessarily refrigerant, but Dan's focus will be mostly on refrigerants, refrigerant leaks. Okay, we got about 72% of the people again. All right, we'll give you, uh, share the results there. And you can see that um, most people are checking the problem units. So that's good. Um, and basically everyone has, has some familiarity, so that's great. And then one more poll, if you'll put up with us for just one more poll. What kind of leak detector are you using? You can select all that apply. People are pausing to think right now. Okay, now that the results are coming in. Okay, that's really fast. Okay, <laughs> got over 80% of people voting. So I'm gonna close it out here real quick, keep this thing moving. Um, soap solution leak detector is 79% uh, and 67%, a heated diode and uh, 24 with re uh, infrared and ultrasonic is 39. Um, and and I don't know what none, oh, none, not none new. It's might be from, from one of those old TV shows. So, Nanu, 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 Nanu. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Dan. And I think you can pick up, you should be able to click on uh, share screen and take over. Uh, it's showing this will uh, stop other screen from sharing. So, yeah, yep, that's fine. Yep. Great, there it is. All right, you see this in full screen? Perfect, widescreen, great. All right, very good, thank you, Bill. Uh, well, thanks to everybody for uh, participating uh, this evening, I really appreciate it. Um, as Bill mentioned, my name is uh, Dan Kelly. Um, I am the Portables Product Manager for Bacharach. I've been there for about a year and a half now. Um, and I previously worked for uh, another um, a manufacturer of electronic instrumentation for the HVAC industry. 
So let's get started. First, we're going to uh, go over the agenda. Um, so the main topics we're going to focus on uh, this evening are, um, number one, why leak detection matters. Um, secondly, uh, leak detection applications, refrigerant types and attributes, and some trends in the refrigerant um, industry. Leak detection technologies, uh, sensitivity and background zeros, and the benefits um, of these uh, qualities in leak detectors. Uh, and then finally, we will take some questions. Okay, so to begin, uh, why do we test for refrigerant leaks? So the first main motivation is for safety compliance. Um, so for refrigerant for refrigeration applications where there's where there is a higher risk of leakage. Um, so some example, examples would be mechanical rooms, uh, chillers, walk-in freezers, cold storage facilities, et cetera. Um, you know, there are regulatory bodies, including ASHRAE. Um, specifically, the regulation is ASHRAE 15, uh, which does require that these rooms contain a fixed and continuous leak detector um, to detect refrigerant leaks. Um, part of this requirement is that it will actually actuate an alarm um, as well as actuate uh, mechanical ventilation in the room. Um, so aside from the fixed leak detectors, which Backrack offers, uh, we also have portable instruments, um, which would then be used um, in this situation to um, search for the exact leak point in a scenario. Uh, and then additionally, many companies um, do have corporate safety policies as well um, to keep both their employees uh, as well as their customers safe. So that's the first um, regu that's the first uh, motivation for why we test for refrigerant leaks. So secondly, would be uh, environmental reasons. Um, so you know, as we all know, in order to reduce global warming and ozone depletion, you know, many countries have um, instituted environmental relate uh, regulations based on you know both the Montreal Protocol as well as the Kigali Amendment, um, which have restricted uh, you know gradually restricted the production. Uh, and sale of CFCs, HCFCs, HF, uh, as well as HFCs. Um, now, specific to the U.S., you know, the EPA 608 um, currently is enforcing uh, the phase down of ozone depleting refrigerants only. Um, it also enforces how records are kept, uh, what leak rate calculations are, the definitions of the leak rate calculations, as well as um, what your leak rate repair times must be. Um, and with EPA 608, um, you know, it's, it's sort of in flux at this point. Um, and, you know, the latest change to EPA 608, you know, no longer enforces the, no longer enforces the phase down of, uh, high GWP refrigerants, um, such as HFCs. Um, and, you know, this is, this is very highly dependent on, um, you know, the, the govern, the government administration, um, you know, de depending, depending on who's in the office at the time. Uh, now there are certainly are states um, who are working together to adopt uh, policies to um, phase down high GWP refrigerants. Um, we also have a uh, CARB in California, specific to California, and you know they um, they do enforce the phase down of high GWP refrigerants, um, such such as HFCs. Uh, and then finally, um, EPA uh, six hundred nine. Um, this is specific to uh, uh, technicians in the motor vehicle um, industry uh, who are working on air conditioning systems, uh, and they must be certified and, you know, to do so um, under this regulation. Uh, Bill, I'm not sure if you had any additional commentary um, on on any of this. No, nope, so far so good. Okay. Um, we did get one question, um, but it's more of an application question. I'll wait a little bit. Okay. All right, and then uh, finally, we have um, the economic motivations. Um, so certainly, refrigerants, refrigerant leaks can be very costly. You know, the more a facility is leaking, the more refrigerant they're losing, and therefore, the more refrigerant they need to replace. Um, you know, some of the new refrigerants are very expensive to replace, as well as some of the older refrigerants, you know, that have been phased out or are being phased out um, and are rising in cost and are more difficult um, to actually get. Um, so, you know, having having um, leak detection, um, both fixed and portable, certainly is going to um, reduce your operating costs, reduce the amount of refrigerant loss, as well as um, top offs. 
Um, it's going to increase the efficiency, the overall efficiency of your system, which is going to um, you know, certainly save on um, energy costs. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, mitigating the refrigerant supply risk. Uh, if you do have one of the, if you are using one of those refrigerants, um, that has been uh, phased out. Uh, and then certainly there's also, um, you know, for, for commercial um, refrigeration and grocery store applications, there's certainly the risk of, um, you know, loss of produce as well. Um, if you, if you are not, um, you know, being diligent in um, searching and fixing for refrigerant leaks. So we, we did get a question here. I guess I'm going to ask both of them right here and uh, just throw them at you if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so do you know the percentage we cannot put refrigerant back in a system and have to leak check first? What percentage of factory charge would cause you to have to do a leak check? What percentage of factory charge? Um, is this from is this from Harry? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What is the percentage that we cannot? You know, I, I'm not certain, Bill, um, but we can we can certainly look into that um, and and get an answer for you, Harry. I'm not sure if you if you had any. Um, yeah, and it might might be more specific. You might need to state the size of the system because I believe that has some bearing on the question, the answer to the question. Okay, understood. And, and one other question came through: um, Any problem using H10 Pro on one two three four YF? Uh, no, the the H10 Pro um, is able to um, detect twelve thirty four YF. Um, you know, typically it's used for automotive applications. We do have many customers who are using it um, in this application. Um, you know, generally we do recommend. Um, you know, similar to testing for HFC refrigerants. We do recommend increasing the heater adjustment slightly um, for for this particular refrigerant. Okay, very good. Carry on. All right. All right. So now we're just going to go into some basics on um, some of the refrigerant leak detection markets um, that we cover. Um, so certainly, I'm sure all of you are familiar, um, you know, with residential and commercial air conditioning applications. Uh, you know, commercial refrigeration applications and mechanical rooms, um, supermarkets and food retail applications, cold storage warehouses, uh, automotive applications, as we just discussed. Um, you know, at, the, at this point, the vast majority of automotive of automobiles um, are using 1234 YF um, for refrigeration. I believe at this point, it's about 80 percent of vehicles in the road. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, white goods manufacturing is another application, uh, which is essentially testing for um, leaks on the production line um, at a factory, which is producing uh, appliances such as air conditioners um, or refrigeration equipment. Um, but there are various other applications as well, including uh, VRF applications for occupied space. Um, so it could be dormitories or hotel rooms, uh, food processing plants. Um, Co-location data centers, you know, where they're housing large, um, large servers. So, for example, um, Amazon has many of these data centers. Uh, and additionally, uh, another application that we cover is uh, marine vessels, uh, you know, which do require uh, refrigeration um, as well. And just to just to reiterate, so for for these applications, you know, a combination of both fixed and portable uh, refrigerant leak detectors can be employed. Um, you know, generally in the mechanical rooms, um, you know, it's a it's a fixed fixed monitor that hangs on the wall and is constantly monitoring for refrigerant leaks. Uh, and Backrack does offer uh, you know both uh, diffusion um, as well as aspirated products. You know, aspirated meaning that it has a built-in sample pump. Um, diffusion meaning that um, the the leak actually has to reach the sensor uh, before it alarms, um, and as we discussed previously, uh, you know these systems do um, allow for connection to building management systems uh, as well as automatic activations of ventilation uh, as well as alarms, um, you know audible and visual, um, both internal in the mechanical room as well as external. Um, and outside the door of the mechanical room.
Okay, so now we're going to go through um, some of the safety group classifications per ASHRAE 34 for refrigerants. Um, so here is a chart which basically shows um, the the types of refrigerants and their and their safety classes. Um, so refrigerants can uh, obviously pose a number of hazards um, relating both to toxicity as well as flammability. Um, you know, they could potentially cause physical hazards to humans. Um, asphyxiation, excuse me, uh, et cetera. So ASHRAE 34 um, does classify these refrigerants um, by hazard based on toxicity and flammability. So um, the safety uh, group classification has uh, two or three um, characters, um, alphanumeric with the first being the toxicity and the second indicating the flammability. Um, so you can see the class three refrigerants um, such as R290 or propane, R600A, um, isobutane. Um, these are considered highly flammable. Um, in the class two, um, these are considered um, less flammable, mildly flammable, uh, considered less flammable, and those in class 2L are mildly flammable. Um, and these classifications are, are used in the guidelines for determining you know, how much refrigerant can be used um, in an occupied space. Um, specific to the, uh, the A3 refrigerants, um, it is recommended, um, to use, if you are testing for, um, R290 or R600A, it is, is always recommended to use, uh, an intrinsically safe, um, leak detector. Um, uh, you do not want to vent, um, uh, vent anything in an enclosed area, um, you know, can potentially explode or start a fire. Um, and typically with the A3 refrigerants, the system charges are very small. Um, you know, typically uh, up to about five ounces. Um, and Backrack does offer for the A3 refrigerants, Backrack does offer uh, a couple different products, um, including the Leakator 10, the Leakator Junior, as well as the Informant 2, um, which are rated as intrinsically safe um, for, um, you know, the, the measurement of these hydrocarbons. And, and that's important to note because we actually did get that question before the, the webinar that okay. you do need to use a uh, combustible gas leak detector for those two A3 refrigerants. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. And so uh, any you know, we'll go other into some, type of some... refrigerant leak detector. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then if we go to uh, just taking a look at the, the A2Ls, um, you know, as I mentioned, these are semi flammable. Um, with low burn velocity, so um, you know generally um, they will, you know, any type of flame will self extinguish. Uh, and for this, it's generally not uh, required to have an intrinsically safe leak detector. Um, and you know, for these, you cannot vent, uh, you know, due to regulation. Um, but generally, this will not, um, you know, these will not cause a fire or explosion. In the majority of cases. And then uh, the you know the A1 and the B1 um, you know there's no uh, no flammability no flame prop propagation for those refrigerants. Okay, so now just looking at um, some examples of common uh, refrigerants by uh, ODP as well as GWP. Um, so you can see um, ODP stands for the ozone depletion potential. Uh, and this is basically the relative amount of um, destruction to the ozone layer that it can cause. Uh, and it's compared to a specific reference substance, um, which would be R R11 or R12, um, both of which um, have an ODP of one. Um, and in this, in, for these particular refrigerants, the lower, um, the lower the number for the ODP, the better. Uh, and then secondly, we have global warming potential. Um, and this it refers to how much heat a greenhouse gas traps in the atmosphere uh, up to a specific time uh, time frame. So uh, typically it's uh, standard for 100 years as the time frame. Uh, and this is also relative uh, to uh, carbon dioxide, um, which has a global warming potential of one. And once again, you know, the lower the number here on these readings, um, you know, the lower the lower the GWP. Any questions on or comments on these? Uh, no, I think you covered that. Um, and there's there's a slew of refrigerants in between. Um, yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Yep. It, it, would you say there's a trend towards uh, ref 
refrigerants that uh, have lesser ODP uh, lately, the ones that are available? Um, yeah, that's that's what we've seen. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's it's strikingly um, so, but uh, is that is that what you've seen recently, Bill? Yeah, that's what that's what I've seen. I think, and that's uh, caused some of the changes, the atmospheric changes that have happened. But the GWP right. is something to pay attention to. So it's really two factors. That's good. Yeah, to cover. absolutely. Okay, so now we'll go over some uh, refrigerant gas types uh, and trends in the market. Um, so first would be uh, HFCs and HFOs. Um, so certainly as, as the world continues to phase out the, um, the high GWP uh, refrigerants such as HFCs, uh, you know, less harmful, harmful uh, HFO refrigerants and natural refrigerants are becoming uh, you know, more popular and turned to as alternatives. Um, so HFCs, you know, certainly um, you know, examples such as R134A, R410A, um, you know, HFCs do not have um, ozone deplete, depleting de potential, and they do have generally lower GWP values um, than their predecessors, CFCs and HCFCs. Um, and HFCs uh, do have a requirement uh, to be recovered. Uh, HFOs, um, you know, such as, you know, 1234YF, as we just discussed, um, these also do not have ozone depleting de potential, um, and they have nearly no. Uh, uh, GWP. Um, and these particular refrigerants, HFOs, uh, they must be recovered um, as they are cons considered uh, semi-flammable um, and A2L classified. CO2. Um, so CO2 uh, is an eco-friendly refrigerant option. Uh, it does require um, high pressure systems. At this point, it is um, certainly more popular in Europe. Um, but it is coming to the U.S., uh, and this, this is certainly going to be a trend in the coming years um, toward increased usage of, CO, uh, of CO2 uh, or for refrigerant applications in the U.S. Um, CO2 can be vented, um, and, but not in an enclosed environment. And as I mentioned, it generally um, has, requires a high-pressure system. Um, and that reason in the enclosed environment is more for occupant safety or uh, yes. like oxygen depletion or something? Yes, that is correct. Yep. Uh, and CO2 has uh, no OD, um, ODP, um, and the 100-year GWP for CO2 is, is one, as, as we sort of mentioned. Right. Yep. Um, okay, so then moving on to uh, hydrocarbon refrigerants. Um, so specific examples, like we talked about, R290 and uh, R600A. Uh, these are considered highly flammable. Um, you know, they are A3 refrigerants. Um, they have no um, ozone depleting the potential. Uh, and they do have very low GWP. Um, they um, they can be they can be vented, um, but not in enclosed environments. Um, and they are, uh, you know, as we mentioned, we do recommend using an intrinsically safe leak detector, um, you know, when testing for refrigerant leaks in these systems. And generally, uh, you know, hydrocarbon refrigerants are used in smaller um, smaller appliances like smaller venting machines or, or cold cases. Um, but there is, uh, there is some movement in increasing um, the charge size uh, for hydrocarbon refrigerants. And then finally, we have ammonia. Um, so ammonia, you know, as it says there, has been used for 100 plus years. Um, it is highly toxic. Um, it does not have um, ozone de depleting potential or, uh, or GWP. Um, and it can be vented, but once again, not in an enclosed area. So these are sort of some general trends, uh, trends in the market. Um, you know, obviously we, I, I didn't, you know, uh, mention um, CFCs and HCFCs uh, as for the most part, you know, these have been, um, these have been phased out, um, but there certainly, um, you know, are some systems out there. Uh, Bill, do you have any, any additional commentary for these, these slides? Um, the, um, uh, ammonia uh, detection. What type of uh, leak detectors used, or how's that how's that managed? Um, so at this point, um, Backrec does have uh, fi uh, fixed monitors um, that use electrochemical sensors for that particular application. Um, generally, we do not currently have a portable leak detector for ammonia. Um, there are some out there, but um, you know it's generally a difficult. Uh, measurement to make, especially if you're looking for very low uh, minimum detection levels. 
Uh, but that, at this point, that is not something we offer for uh, for important movement streams. And the application for ammonia is usually those um, cold storage. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, so moving on. Um, so this is um, so this figure basically uh, is just is once again just showing refrigerant trends in the industry. Um, so you know as as uh, policymakers and governments are considering alternatives for um, your traditional refrigerants, um, you know the manufacturers as well as as, as contractors, policymakers, everybody, uh, you know they really have a balancing act to do um, to to cover the environmental concerns. And that, once again, that includes ozone, ozone depletion, um, global warming, um, as well as leak rates, uh, and then certainly indirect environmental concerns, um, such as energy efficiency, uh, safety and performance. So it's really a balancing act that they're trying to, to do here. Um, so you can see on the left side of this screen, uh, from high to low, you see the pressure capacity. So CO2 um, is considered up in the top left corner. Uh, it's an A1 non-flammable refrigerant. Um, it does have very high pressure applications. Uh, and then, you know, similarly, you have uh, R123, a uh, very low pressure, um, and once again, non-flammable. Um, and then you can see on the on the far right side, we have some of the legacy refrigerants, some of these HFC refrigerants and CFC refrigerants, um, you know, which, which certainly um, do have, um, you know, high GWP and high ODP. Um, which, you know, really is the main reason uh, for, you know, the further you get to the right on this chart, um, the higher the GWP level. And this is really the main motivation um, you know, for switching to, um, you know, HFOs, some HFCs, as well as um, natural refrigerants. I think the one big takeaway from this is it's a complex scenario and we're glad you're here. <laughs> Attendees, we're glad you're here. Uh, to absorb more information. The, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, we did announce this in the, the publicity for, but we will be giving away uh, an H10 Pro uh, for those of you that stay to the end. So I um, want to make sure you, you make note of that. Absolutely. All right. So moving on here to um, some common leak detection methods. <clears throat> so, uh, as I heard uh, John Passarello say in a webinar last week, um, he said everything leaks, and it's just a matter of leak rate, um, and that is correct. And I do agree with him in this particular situation. Um, so, a few common methods, um, you know, most common methods for leak detection. Uh, first, as you all know, would be the soap bubble method. Um, certainly, is a mainstay um, in the industry for decades. Um, you know, it's it's good for pinpointing leaks. Um, but it can be undermined if the leak is very small or if it's windy outdoors. Um, you know, generally, um, it's inexpensive and easy, easy to use, good for pinpointing small leaks. Um, you know, our recommendation is to use a soap bubble method in combination um, with an electronic leak detector. Um, and I know, uh, you know, many technicians are currently doing so. Um, secondly is um, ultraviolet and fluorescent dye applications. Um, you know, some of the benefits would be that it, you know, can simultaneously find multiple leaks in a system, um, you know, but there are some adverse effects, including um, it can be messy, it can affect system performance and longevity, and there are some uh, uh, manufacturers of equipment that actually do not allow this to be, uh, to be used for leak detection. Uh, and then finally is electronic leak detectors. Um, you know, these are the most popular methods for leak detection. Um, they are highly sensitive and will locate leaks uh, both efficiently and effectively. Uh, and there are a few different uh, detection principles uh, for electronic leak detection uh, that we will go through here. Very good. All right. So the first uh, detection principle is non-dispersive infrared or NDIR. Um, so this is an example of um, how the how the infrared uh, bench works. So the main components of an infrared sensor are the infrared source on the left side, which is essentially a lamp, um, the sample chamber or tube um, in the middle. You have a light filter uh, or an optical filter, uh, as well as the infrared detector. So uh, the infrared light is directed uh, through the sample chamber and toward the detector. 
uh, and then gas molecules um, will absorb light energy at specific frequencies, um, you know, in the infrared spectrum. Um, and then for each individual gas, the absorption properties are uniquely uh, different uh, for each refrigerant. And the detector is going to um, detect the light intensity um, from the um, uh, in, or in order to determine the concentration level um, of that particular gas. Uh, so Bacharach does have a few different products which use infrared sensor technologies. Um, you know, our uh, multi-zone fixed refrigerant monitors, uh, as well as um, our um, PGM IR portable refrigerant monitor. Um, these do use um, a highly sensitive, um, extremely low uh, MDL or minimum detection level um, uh, infrared bench, um, which provides an MDL of one part per million. Um, and you know we will uh, go into a little more detail um, of some of those some of those products here shortly. Um, so some of the main advantages of infrared leak detection um, would be, you know, generally it's highly sensitive um, and it's highly selective to refrigerant compounds. Um, it does have a very long sensor life uh, and uh, quick reaction and recovery time. Uh, and generally the sensitivity does not degrade over time. Um, some of the disadvantages of infrared um, would be that it's generally expensive to manufacture. It does have high power consumption. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it also is larger than most of your, um, you know, smaller uh, heated diode, for example, or semiconductor sensors. Okay, so now we're going to discuss uh, the heated diode leak detector. Um, so the, this type of leak detector works by uh, actually heating up the refrigerant and breaking the molecules apart. Um, so when the molecules are broken apart, it will, uh, it will result in a positively charged chlorine and fluorine ion. Um, so the way that this, uh, the heat dial will then detect those ions and ions and sound an alarm either audibly or visually, um, or both. So the way that, um, this sensor is actually, um, made is it has a coiled wire, as you can see there, uh, with this, which is coated in ceramic material. Uh, and this is heated by an internal heating element. Um, and then, you know, once again, the refrigerant gas is heated to the point that the molecules are broken apart. Um, and then, uh, you know, the current is created, um, you know, while detecting the presence of chlorine and fluorine uh, will create a audible and visual alarm. The sensor that you see on the right hand side, that is the sensor that we use for the, the H10 Pro. Um, the H10 Pro is the, uh, the best leak detector for um, using heated diode um, on the market, in my opinion, but that, that is, uh, you know, one of that back racks best selling products. Um, and, you know, we'll go into a little more detail on uh, that particular instrument here shortly. Um, some of the advantages of heated diode um, sensors would be, it is highly sensitive to halogens. Um, it does have uh, both quick reaction as well as quick recovery time. Um, some disadvantages is that can, you know, sometimes it can be expensive to manufacture um, and the sensor life is um, relatively shorter um, than some infrared instruments. Um, however, you know, keep in mind the extreme sensitivity, um, you know, it's, you're, you're, it's sort of a trade-off. Um, you know, typically the, the sensor for the H10 Pro, uh, you know, depending on um, what you have the heater setting adjusted to, um, you know, generally will last, um, you know, approximately 80 hours or so. Um, but, you know, once again, it really depends on the concentration of refrigerant that the sensor is exposed to, uh, as well as the heater setting um, uh, that, that, the, that the instrument is typ typically set to. And just for size comparison, even that infrared sensor, I mean, what that's probably what, like a couple inches long or can vary in size, I guess. Uh, are you referring to the infrared or the yeah? You know, going back to the infrared, just give people like a spatial idea. Yeah, I mean, it really it really depends on the manufacturer. Um, you know, back rack. You know, some of the back rack products um, do use you know a quite large infrared sensor. Um, there are other products that use smaller, um, both back rack as well as some um, some competitors. Um, and you know, certainly the longer the longer the optical chamber, um, you know, the lower the MDL generally um, you'll be able to get um, uh, from uh, infrared sensors. But you know, it really 
it really all depends on, um, you know, the manufacturer and the sensitivity that you're looking for. But, you know, for some of the handheld leak detectors, uh, you know, it's a little more difficult to get, um, you know, obviously a, a longer infrared bench, um, you know, in a small handheld. Okay. And yeah, and I guess the, the minimum detection level sort of dictates the size of the infrared tube and, and that um, the heated diode one that's like the size of maybe like a, uh, like the cap in your pen or something like that? I mean, just to give people again a, a reference. Yeah, I'd say maybe slightly, you know, slightly larger diameter than the cap of your pen. Um, but, you know, relatively, uh, you know, for the H10 Pro in particular, you know, it's easy to, re easy to replace in the field. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind with, um, you know, heated diode detectors is that, um, you know, you, you need to let them warm up for a couple of minutes. Um, generally for the H10 Pro, we do recommend, you know, turning the instrument on and letting it warm up for two minutes. Um, you know, before doing your testing. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, with the H10 Pro, you do have an adjustable sensitivity and adjustable heater setting. Um, so the hotter this, you know, the hotter the sensor is, the more sensitive it's going to be. Um, so generally for HFC refrigerants, um, you know, for, for the H10 Pro, uh, you do want to increase your heater sensitivity. Um, and that heater just adjustment is um, provided out of the factory at approximately eight o'clock or nine o'clock. So if you're looking at, at uh, into the heater adjustment area, um, you know, there's a, you basically, you can, you can adjust it using, um, you know, using a small flathead screwdriver. Uh, and generally um, when it's um, received from the factory, it's about eight or nine o'clock. Um, and you're going to want to increase that to, uh, you know, approximately one or two o'clock. Um, if you are looking for those um, HFC refrigerants, such as R410A. Got it. Oh, one, one question did come in. Yeah. Um, how do you know when a sensor is becoming weak? Is there any kind of uh, alert to that? Um, well, generally, the instrument will just be, um, will be less sensitive overall. You'll be able to determine. Uh, the nice part about the H10 Pro is that we actually have an onboard calibration system. So before, you, before yeah. using the instrument, um, and, you know, we have, we have some videos on YouTube, which basically show the quick and simple, um, uh, calibration process, but it's a really nice option for, um, for leak detectors because you know, from the start, um, whether the, whether the heater adjustment is where it should be. Um, and if the sensor uh, is operating properly, um, but, you know, once again, with, with heated diode sensors, um, you know, the, the higher the concentration is it's exposed to, um, the heater, the, the, the higher the heater setting and the longer you use it, it's really a matter of the number of hours and the concentration it's exposed to. Sort of like tires on the car. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. All right. Um, so now moving on to um, semiconductor um, detection principle. So a semiconductor um, uses a thin metal oxide film that's deposited on a silicon, a silicon wafer. Um, and then the target gas um, on the heated surface is going to um, modify the electric resistance or conductivity. Um, so you can see, um, you know, that the electrode shown on the left side, left side there. Um, so the change in the electrical property um, is going to correlate to a specific gas concentration. Um, so we do use a heated diode sensor for, um, you know, a couple of our handheld leak detectors, um, you know, including, um, the leak Gator 10, the leak Gator junior, as well as the Informa two, um, you know, generally, um, you know, for these particular sensors, um, you know, the advantages are that it has, you know, relatively low power consumption. Um, it does detect both refrigerants as well as combustible gases. Um, so this is one of the benefits to, um, the product that Backrack offers the Informant 2, which has um, replaceable probe tips um, or sensors, one for refrigerants and one for combustibles. Um, and then generally, they're uh, inexpensive to manufacture as well. Um, some of the disadvantages to semiconductor uh, sensors would be, uh, you know, they, are, they do have a cross sensitivity um, to a number of substances other than refrigerants. Um, and they also have... Um, generally lower and slower reaction time um, than some of the heated diode um, or the infrared sensors. Sounds good. All right. Okay, and now moving on to uh, ultrasonic detection principles. 
Um, so an ultrasonic leak detector um, is a leak detector that detects um, basically um, the ultrasound, uh, the sound that, that sorry, that, that detects ultrasound leaks that, may, that, that leaks make. So it's outside of human hearing range. So um, ultrasonics are going to respond to any type of ultrasound uh, and not to um, the type of gas leaking. So essentially, ultrasonics can detect any type of gas, including air, nitrogen, refrigerant, CO2, and vacuum, et cetera. Um, so the detected sound is converted uh, into an audible uh, sound via a process called heterodyning. Uh, and heterodyning will keep the sound quality and the, uh, the content intact. Um, and this is going to help the user to distinguish between sound leaks make and other uh, competing sounds, um, you know, potentially, potentially in the area. Um, and so Baccarat does offer um, a few different models um, for ultrasonic products. Um, and we are going to, you know, go into that here shortly. Um, you know, some of the advantages of ultrasonics, um, as I mentioned, you know, they can be used on any type of gas, you know, as long as there is um, some type of pressure for vacuum. Um, there is no consumables required. So that's a key. You know, you don't have to um, replace sensors. You don't have to replace um, filters, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, there are, there are various applications, you know, checking, um, you know, leaks from bearings, pneumatic lines, car tires, et cetera. Um, some of the disadvantages would be that it's, you know, difficult, generally difficult to, uh, or can be difficult to pinpoint uh, leaks in noisy environments. Um, and it's generally less sensitive um, than other electronic uh, leak detectors. Um, you know, may not be able to find those very small leaks that, you know, a heated diode or infrared um, sensor may, um, you know, may be able to find. And then, you know, also just the fact that it's a little more, a um, little more difficult to use um, than some of the more basic handheld leak detectors. Would you say there's like a pressure range that they work under? Um, so we're going to, we're going to go into some of the specific. Ah, okay. I'm uh, jumping ahead. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> we have, I have some of the, the ranges for. Good, um, good. Yeah, for those. Thanks. Okay. Um, so two of the main um, attributes of a leak detector that um, you know, we're going to discuss now, um, you know, which make a leak detector um, effective would be uh, sensitivity uh, or low MDL as well as background zero. Um, so for sensitivity, um, you know, with low MDL leak detectors, um, the major benefit here is that there's more reliable detection. You can find small, both small and large leaks. Um, you're going to find leaks more quickly and save time as well as miss few leaks. Um, with the background zero, both, you know, whether it's automatic or uh, manual, um, you know, a couple different ways you can do it, either with charcoal filter or with fresh air. Um, so with the charcoal filter, you are able to continuously leak. Uh, an environment in a contaminated environment, so where there's a lot of background refrigerant, um, you know, having a charcoal filter um, actually allows you to um, scrub ambient refrigerant present in the area of operation. Um, some of the instruments that use fresh air, um, you know, generally um, you do need to be, uh, you know, for some of these applications, um, you know, where there's a there's a gross leak or you're in a contaminated environment, um, you know, sometimes the the instruments that use fresh air for the reference sample. Um, you know, they, they may not be as effective for the larger leaks, but um, generally for, you know, the smaller leaks, for the, the small pinpointing, um, you know, the, the fresh air background zero, um, you know, is sufficient. And oftentimes leak detectors will, uh, you know, do an automatic background zero um, every few seconds. Um, and, you know, having this, this background zero, um, you know, effectively allows technicians to remain on task uh, as well as have less, less downtime. So like a lot of, products, you know, any kind of detection product, the, the more the instrument it does for you, the more it costs, but then sort of the more it takes, more of the tedious details it takes out of your hand, like finding fresh air versus bringing kind of, it's bringing aboard its own fresh air with the charcoal filter. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, we, Backrack does have a product, the PGMIR, um, which does take um, a, a reference sample um, from a charcoal filter built in. And as I mentioned, you know, that's actually done um, every couple of minutes, it draws in um, clean air, which has been scrubbed um, of ambient refrigerant. Um, and, you know, this essentially allows you to continue testing 
um, for, you know, for long periods of time in a contaminated environment. Right. So you either, either you do the work or you bring the product to do the work. So yes. Yeah. That's the value. All right. I think I just saw a question come through. Um, does the R11 test bottle have a shelf life, even if it's not used often? Um, yes, because if you, you know, if you do open that test bottle, um, it is, you know, eventually going to leak out. That will take a long time. Um, I can't give you a specific time frame. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I can certainly look into that and, and, uh, provide that information to Bill to, uh, to send out. Yeah. Like, like you said earlier, everything leaks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, so so let's start off why uh, to discuss why uh, low minimum detection levels uh, leak detection matters. Um, so it matters because concentrations um, throughout a large facility will always remain low. Um, so in in certain uh, commercial refrigeration applications, um, you know, higher MDL instruments are not going to be as effective um, because they will not be able to detect the presence of all leaks. Um, so when you enter one of these facilities, there's a lot of airflow, there's a lot of ventilation. It's simply a large space with a lot of dilution. Um, so having the ability to detect very low levels of refrigerant, um, and you know, I'm basically saying, you know, uh, under, um, you know, between one, uh, you know, two, three um, parts per million. Um, you know, this is certainly a major advantage in being able to number one find leaks from far away. Um, you know, finding the simply the presence of a leak um, overall, and then um, you know, once once you've done that, you'll be able to find, you'll be able to hone in on the leak more quickly, um, as opposed to simply um, you know spot checking every um, you know every orifice and every piece of equipment. Um, so that's you know one of the major benefits to um, the low MDL leak detectors. Um, so one thing that we found, you know, through some of our testing is that refrigerant leaks do diffuse rapidly from the leak source, um, from the leak point, should I say. So at that leak point in the center of this circle here, this is basically just showing, um, you know, the, uh, the diameter of a, of a leak. So you can see in the center at the leak point, the, the concentration of the refrigerant gas is going to be um, very high. And then very quickly, um, upon leaving and moving, you know, moving away from that specific leak point, um, the concentration of refrigerant is actually going uh, to rapidly diffuse um, from that leak point. Uh, it could be within a few feet, you know, suddenly you, ha you actually have very ultra low um, levels. And this, um, you know, this chart on the, on the right hand side basically depicts that, um, you know, that as you, the as you get further away from the leak point, you can see uh, on the X axis, the distance from the leak point, as that increases, the refrigerant concentration, um, you know, is going um, is going to uh, to decrease. Uh, so here's a specific example of um, a test that I had done in a mechanical room of a grocery store in Buffalo. Um, specifically, um, we had found a leak. Um, that was approximately um, 500 parts per million, um, which was one inch away from the area. Um, however, we were able to actually find this leak standing 10 feet away. So you can see the, the PPM concentrations um, um, in each of the outer rings. So standing about 10 feet away, the PPM reading um, you know, from the PGMIR, PGMIR leak detector was uh, between two and seven parts per million. Um, on the right hand side, this is essentially just to show, um, you know, once again, the benefit of the one PPM MDL. So this is a, this is essentially a lab test um, where we've input, um, you know, a single um, one PPM of refrigerant and the Baccarat PGMIR, which also uses the same sensor um, as our uh, multi-zone uh, fixed refrigerant monitors. Um, you can see that it's extremely linear, extremely accurate, and um, has a, 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 P, a one ppm MDL. So every time we increase the concentration of refrigerant, it reads that specific concentration. Um, some of the competing leak detectors that we that we have tested um, do not have this low level um, 
MDL, which may be required to find certain leaks. So essentially what this chart is showing that, you know, at 8 ppm input, um, you know, the the Bacharach infrared sensor is detecting, um, you know, 8 ppm, whereas some other instruments, um, you know, we're not, we're continued to read zero, um, you know, until we um, actually went up right next to the leak point. Um, so, you know, once again, this is one of the benefits to being able to have a low MDL because you can detect the presence of refrigerant, um, you know, far away from the leak point. Um, so in this particular um, scenario in the mechanical room, upon entering the room, as I mentioned, um, you know, we were getting, um, the, there was a fan on and we were reading approximately two parts per million on the display screen of the PGM. Um, the other, the other instrument was zero. And then if we, um, when we turn the fan off, we could see that it went to seven parts per million. Um, so the point here to, is just to show once again, that, um, you know, this low level MDL, um, is highly beneficial, um, in allowing you to, you know, simply detect the presence of a leak in the room, uh, without this type of, um, minimum detection level. Um, you may leave the facility without having ever known that there was a leak. So, so in that picture there of the PGM, it, it does say 7 ppm R22. Why is that? Um, so that's so th at that point, um, that's when we were standing, you know, approximately 10 feet away or so from the leak point. Um, okay. And I, I didn't I don't have the, the photo here showing when we entered the room, um, but. Essentially, you know, as, as I mentioned, once we turned off the fan, you know, there's less dilution air um, in the room. There's less less airflow. Um, so we the, that's why the reading had increased. Um, but, you know, standing far away from, um, you know, from the leak point, we were able to uh, essentially follow the increasing part per million um, levels until we got to this specific point. And you can actually tune it to the gas you're looking at? Yes, that's correct. So for, for the PGMIR, um, there is a refrigerant library that's selectable um, where you're actually able to uh, select a specific um, refrigerant type. In this scenario, it was R22. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and then just, you know, a similar scenario, um, except this is depicting the background zeroing. So upon entering a room, um, you can see that the PGMIR reading was approximately 15 parts per million, uh, whereas the other... Um, the other uh, product was reading about six par parts per million, um, so uh, you know a lesser MDL. Um, and then after about two minutes of being in the room, so the concentrations were relatively high for for ambient air, you know, 15 ppm. Um, so what what happened was, um, you know, the the PGMIR um, after about a couple minutes, it did its um, auto zero using fresh air from um, the that's been scrubbed of refrigerant by the, uh, the charcoal filter. Uh, the other product was um, simply using the background air, which as I mentioned, you know, many leak detectors simply are using um, the fresh air. But if you're in an environment which is contaminated with refrigerant, um, then you're going to be zeroing on refrigerant, um, you know, which in this particular scenario dropped the reading down to zero. Um, and so sort of the, once again, just showing the benefit of, uh, you know, having a charcoal filter that um, it's going to allow you to continue testing an environment um, which is contaminated with refrigerant um, as opposed to, um, you know, zeroing on um, the background refrigerant um, and, you know, having to, um, you know, go, go find fresh air to uh, once again uh, zero the instrument. Got it. And, and Jim Burke points out that it does over, it's calibrated over 50 refrigerants too. Yes, that is correct. It has over 50 refrigerant uh, gas library, uh, and we do add um, various um, refrigerants, you know, as, as they um, come about, um, you know, on a yearly basis, we do add uh, multiple refrigerants. Okay, um, some of the, some best practices for leak detection, and I apologize, Bill, we're going um, a little longer than I uh, expected. Um, I'll try to pick it up here. Um, so some best, best practices for leak detection. Um, one would be allowing the instrument to uh, sufficiently warm up. Um, we always recommend, um, certainly for a product like the H10 Pro, um, to charge the battery before use. Um, you know, if you for a heated diode um, sent, uh, instrument like the H10 Pro, um, you know, charging the battery beforehand 
um, you know, is going to allow you to have, um, you know, the right, the right gain, um, you know, before adjusting the sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, um, you know, ensuring that the instrument is configured properly, you know, many instruments, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what manufacturer we're talking about. There are various sensitivity levels, leak size, um, levels and various settings. Um, and then also, you know, possibly doing a bump test prior to using the instrument. Uh, this is one of the benefits of the H10 Pro is that you can do the automatic calibration uh, prior to using the instrument. Um, but, you know, just generally making sure that you, un you understand the way the instrument works uh, and all the settings um, on the instruments. That's uh, a good general statement for anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's true, though. You know, just, just you know, generally, um, even, you know, before you go out into the field and do your tests, just mess, you know, mess around um, at home using the instrument, making sure you know exactly what to expect when you're in the field. Um, you know, you could even be testing with, uh, you know, a, a can of keyboard cleaner or something, um, you know, sort of uh, to, to act as a refrigerant. Um, but, you know, that's, all, that's certainly always recommended. Um, so starting to check uh, at high probability areas, um, which, you know, I show some examples here, joints, fittings, uh, elbows, couplings, reducers, flanges, et cetera. Um, you know, obvious, this is, this is obvious to everyone. Um, just, you know, obviously making sure that you are uh, checking the, the highest probability areas, um, you know, before beginning the test. Um, and then obviously being methodical and taking time uh, to check all areas this way, you know, you are not leaving, leaving the facility, um, you know, without having found potential leaks. Got a couple of questions come in. Yeah. Uh, if I, uh, should mention, uh, putting a leak detector in a condensate drain um, to check the evap coil, is it a good practice? In a, in a condensate drain? Yeah, I guess. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I would say that, um, you know, certainly to be very careful, um, you know, that you're not sucking up any, um, any condensate. Um, you know, some, some instruments do have, uh, you know, built in hydrophobic filters. Um, but, you know, certainly being very careful, especially when you're input, when you're dropping the, um, you know, the sensor or the, uh, you know, the probe into an area that you can't actually see. Um, so it certainly is, is recommended maybe to have a flashlight, um, so that you can actually see, uh, exactly where the instrument is dropping into. Um, you know, it, okay. it could be an area, um, you know, where, where there, you would be detecting a refrigerant, but generally, uh, would you agree with that, that bill, you know, certainly making sure that you, uh, uh yeah, basically if, if it's the best pathway for the refrigerant, it might work, but if it's not a good pathway for the refrigerant, it might not be the best place because you're looking for gas, which is just going to sort of move on its own with the pressures and things like that. So right. um, it really depends. Sorry. One of those depends answers. Okay. Um, so some additional uh, best practices and tips. So um, clearing the target area, um, you know, with fresh air before looking for small leaks, uh, especially if a large leak was already present. Uh, and that sort of goes back to what we were discussing, how, um, you know, you, if you're using an instrument which you know is zeroing to fresh air, you want to make sure that there isn't a large amount of uh, refrigerant present in, present in the area that you're that you're zeroing to. Um, generally, for you know many handheld leak detectors, it's uh, recommended to you know move the probe slowly a couple inches per second, um, you know to find those smaller leaks. Um, if the if the instrument does alarm, um, you want to make sure that you then pull it away rather quickly for a few seconds to let it. Uh, and, and once again, this is this is for the instruments generally that are um, uh, that are zeroing uh, on fresh air automatically every few seconds. You want to make sure you pull it away um, and then return uh, a few seconds later um, to the specific leak point just to double check um, that it was indeed a, a refrigerant leak. Um, you know, keeping the leak detector filters clean, uh, watching out for moisture. So that goes goes to what I was saying. You know, don't allow the instrument uh, you know to uh, to suck up any water. Um, and you know, that uh, be aware that the leak ticker does have an automatic, uh, background adjustment if it does have that. Uh, and that, that sort of goes back to the comment regarding, um, you know, moving slowly, um, you know, around a potential leak point. Uh, and then also, um, uh, just the point about, you know, point leak detection versus area monitoring. Um, you know, so point leak detection would be using an instrument such as the H10 Pro, uh, you know, such as. Uh, the true point IR or the informant two, um, that's more, you know, point leak detection. 
um, you know, finding, you know, finding leaks at, at the specific leak point or, you know, knowing where, the, where in particular the system is. Area monitoring is a little more um, closely related to um, the PGMIR instrument that I was uh, discussing where you actually have, um, you know, you, you have a larger area um, that you're actually testing to, you know, to actually hone in on the, um, the potential um, refrigerant, refrigerant leak, um, the, the, sort of the cloud of refrigerant. Okay, um, so some maintenance considerations uh, for leak detectors. So the vast majority of issues, um, you know, that do occur with leak detectors, um, you know, can be solved by, you know, either essentially replacing the sensor, replacing the filter, or, um, you know, charging or replacing the batteries. Um, you know, with some sensors, as I mentioned, periodic verification with a leak standard um, is an option. As I said, the H10 Pro has this um, on board. There are also some leak detectors where you can buy as an option a leak, uh, you know, a, a calibrated leak standard um, that has a specific leak rate. Um, <clears throat> for uh, heated diode sensors, generally replace once a year. It may be more frequent than that, as I sort of alluded to previously. Um, you know, obviously, if you're exposing the instrument to very high levels of refrigerant um, you know, for long periods of time, um, you know, the, the sensor is going to and, and you have the high um, uh, setting on the heating element, um, the sensor will not last as long. And then for NDIR sensors, you know, preventing condensation or dirt from entering the instrument, um, you know, this could create um, both accuracy as, as well as uh, you know, long term concerns for the sensor. Um, for the batteries, you know, ensuring, um, you know, if, it, if it's disposable batteries, uh, making sure that those are replaced over time. Um, if it's, uh, you know, a lithium ion um, or um, other types of batteries, you certainly want to make sure you do charge before use. Um, you know, as sort of as I, as I was mentioning with the H10 Pro, you do want to make sure that you charge your, recharge the battery um, to ensure um, that the, the heating element is going to be as effective as you need. Um, and then with the filters, obviously replacing um, when they become visibly dirty or wet, um, you know, dirty filters are going to decrease the flow to the sensor, um, which will decrease sensitivity. So this is sort of a, a major point. You want to make sure that you're always uh, periodically checking and replacing your sensors. Uh, I'm sorry, your, your filters, because um, this may be the cause of the instrument not detecting refrigerant due to decreased flow. Just like you tell your customers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so just going through, a few, uh, Bill, do you have any any input or anything else you wanted me to mention there? Just a couple bits of feedback we'll ask later. Okay. Okay, so just running through uh, a few of the uh, back rack leak detectors, you know, sort of as I mentioned, we have a few different instruments, um, you know, varying in price, varying in performance and sensitivity. Uh, you know, varying in uh, sensor life as well as technology. Um, you know, certainly the H10 Pro is, um, you know, one of the most sensitive instruments on the market. Um, you know, this, uh, it's, you know, relatively um, relatively expensive compared to some other uh, more handheld leak detectors. Um, but you have that ultra sensitivity, um, which allows you to find leaks rather quickly. Um, we also have the TruePoint IR, uh, which is obviously an infrared instrument. Um, you know, one of the benefits is the sensor lasts longer. Uh, it does have pretty good sensitivity. It has a 15-inch uh, flexible pro chip, probe tip and a rechargeable battery, uh, as well as an automatic um, zeroing mechanism. Uh, and then finally, um, the TruePoint, which is sort of a lower cost option um, uh, for, uh, for leak detection as well. Um, for the combustible gas leak detectors, um, so this would be you know, for hydrocarbon carbon refrigerants, um, such as R290 or R600A, um, you know, uh, generally the main difference between the Leakator Junior and the Leakator 10, uh, both, both instruments are intrinsically safe, which is a major benefit. Um, but the main difference here is that um, with the Leakator 10, you do have the manual sensitivity adjustment, um, whereas the Leakator Junior has um, the auto zeroing uh, function. Um, and then we also have the dual um, gas detector, um, which, you know, once again, has interchangeable sensors, both for refrigerants as well as for combustibles. Uh, and this instrument is indeed uh, intrinsically safe as well. 
Uh, and then finally, just mentioning, you know, some of the ultrasonic um, instruments that we do have. Um, you can see, you know, they do uh, have various options and, um, you know, frequency ranges, um, you know, you know, various performance indicators and, and price ranges. Um, but these are the three products that we that we do offer um, for the ultrasonic leak detection. Uh, and then finally, the product that uh, we know uh, Bill is giving away today, um, the H10 Pro. We sort of mentioned, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these options here. But some of the main um, takeaways would be, you know, it, it can pinpoint both small and large refrigerant leaks in various applications, including automotive. Um, you know, it can detect, um, you know, HFOs as well as HFCs. Um, it has both the automatic as well as the uh, manual mode of operation. So in the automatic mode, um, this this greatly reduces any uh, false alarms while also retaining sensitivity to locate uh, smaller, medium sized leaks. Um, and, you know, once again, pinpointing a leak in this mode in the auto mode requires continuous probe movement uh, in the manual mode. Um, you know, this is going to require, you know, a little more frequent readjustment. Um, there's a manual balance m um, knob on the instrument. Um, to uh, essentially maintain the required one tick per second rate, um, which the instrument needs in order to remain in calibration. That can always be tested with the, the onboard calibration bottle. Um, and then, um, you know, the instrument also has, as I mentioned, the, the, um, the onboard calibration and heater adjustment, um, which does allow you to increase um, the heating element and increase sensitivity for certain refrigerants as well as the rechargeable battery. Looks like we have a few uh, few questions coming in. Yes, um, there's a question about the informant. He has uh, interchangeable tips for combustibles yes. or refrigerants. Yeah, that is correct. So it does need to be. Um, you know, you can you can switch. Um, you know, from the combustible to um, you know, to the refrigerant sensor, but it would actually need to be physically uh, swapped on the probe tip. And the instrument does include uh, both of those. Oh, Jim Burke already got that answer. All right. Thank you, Jim. Um, and then, okay, great. And then there's a little feedback on the, um, the manual mode and the smaller adjustment knobs seems to make no difference. Maybe. Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, on the H10 Pro in manual mode, the yes. small adjustment knob seems to have no range making, it just seems to have no range making fine tuning difficult. Okay. Where, where is that comment? I, um, it's coming from pixel three at 801. Three. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I can, I can certainly, um, you know, reach out to a uh, bill. If you might be able to provide me with the, the contact sure. information for that customer, I can, you know, we have, uh, I can certainly walk, Walk, um, walk them through it as well as, um, you know, provide some training materials and some training videos, um, you know, to, uh, to help them out. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've sort of gone over time at this point. Um, so again, Bill, I apologize for going longer than expected, but um, you know, here is my contact information. Anybody is going you know, to feel free to uh, give me a call, shoot me an email uh, with anything. Um, you know, and certainly, um, you know, Bill Spohn has also does a great job, you know, representing our products. Um, and, you know, you can always, uh, you know, find our leak detectors uh, with very good prices at True Tech. Very good. Um, thank you. So um, I'm going to switch back to my screen and just close it out here. Uh, so uh, as we noted, uh, is that the right screen showing up now? Right there. Okay. So for everyone who stayed up to this point, and so the point is 8.09, uh, we will go back and check the logs. Uh, and then a random uh, name will be drawn and the winner will be contacted tomorrow by email. Um, or if you give us a, your phone number, we'll contact you by phone. And uh, we will let you know who's won the, uh, the prize. And we'll also announce on social media with the first name and last initial of the winner. Um, again, Dan, it provides contact info. I got it brought up here on screen again. And again, True Tech, we carry, I'm very proud to carry the full Backerack line. You can see truetechtools.com forward slash Backerack. Will give you access to every single type of product that they manufacture and the refrigerant leak detectors are there up on that top line. Uh, also encourage you to follow us on social media for other opportunities like this, other trainings, 
uh, look at our website for technical materials, and especially look at our blog. We're starting to do a little bit more with our blog lately. Uh, it's also in the top menu bar of our website. Uh, we wanted to uh, thank everyone for coming here tonight.